Excuse me, everyone. We now have our speakers in conference. Please be aware that each of your lines is in a listen-only mode. At the conclusion of the presentation, we will open the floor for questions. At that time, instructions will be given if you would like to ask a question. I would now like to turn the conference over to Dr. Benjamin. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to thank you very much for being here with us today. Um, this is one of three webinars we're having um, over the um, next uh, several months to begin talking a bit about um, uh, some changes we're doing in uh, the APHA membership. Um, so we're really pleased that you could be with us today. This is um, hopefully an opportunity for us to reach out to our members um, to help give some clarity about what the um, board and the governing council are trying to do. So, you know, one of the things we, we are, um, we're, we're looking at is this whole idea of reinvention. And um, I always start this presentation by um, asking folks uh, kind of what do these four items come to mind. We probably could have picked uh, more or different items, um, but uh, you see an, an old rotary phone there, a typewriter, uh, a piece of carbon paper, which my, my kids um, aren't, have never probably seen. Um, and some of you are certainly old enough to remember the old Eastern Airlines. And, of course, what makes these things all in common um, is that for all practical purposes, they're extinct or they're, obs they're obsolete. Um, and I think the lesson from that is, of course, you always want to try to adapt before you, you can't adapt. Um, the, the other thing is, uh, in terms of, of trying to figure out how one makes change, um, there's an old story about how NASA, NASA spent lots of money um, to try to develop um, a writing instrument. Um, they wanted something with the following characteristics that could write clearly, uh, something that was dependable, something that would work in, in zero gravity. Obviously, they work in space and zero gravity, so they needed something that would work in that environment, uh, and was lightweight. Um, lightweight um, is important because weight is a big deal. Um, on a spacecraft where, where uh, space and weight is, uh, uh, is at a premium. Um, and, and they spent lots of money in doing this um, um, and really didn't come up with a really satisfactory solution. Now, some of you may know that eventually they, they did figure out uh, how to have such a pen. Um, but, of course, someone then asked what the Russians uh, used um, for their cosmonauts. Um, and when they did that, um, they found out they used a pencil. Uh, if you think about it, it certainly um, you, has all the characteristics uh, that the million-dollar um, writing instrument uh, uh, would have had. Uh, it also tells us that sometimes others have our answers, and so sometimes we always have to look outside ourselves uh, if we're trying to look for solutions to challenging problems. Now, um, the board... Um, always points out that we really have really four uh, revenue streams. Um, obviously, the annual meeting is one of our biggest products. Um, our membership, um, which is not only one of our major assets, but, of course, uh, membership dues. Um, the publications division, um, um, particularly when our, our two best sellers, the Standard Methods Text and the um, CCDM, uh, which is the Communicable Disease Manual, um, come out. Those are major revenue streams for us. Uh, and then a range of programs that we have, either the, through um, grants and, and contracts and programs uh, that are funded from outside sources. But if you think about it, APHA really has these four major uh, revenue streams. And so when one's thinking about reinventing oneself, uh, one has to take these four revenue streams into account. So um, in 2008, um, uh, I asked the board to begin to work with um, me and then eventually the governing council to begin rethinking um, where we want to go as an organization for the future. Um, this, this has been a, a process that's been in the works for some time. Um, we've, we've superficially looked at all four of these uh, revenue streams, but we really decided we wanted to do a deep dive uh, into membership. And so membership is the one that we've really done the, the deep dive in first. We recognize this is the foundation of who we are and what we are. Uh, and we, we, we thought we had some membership challenges over the years, which um, staff are going to talk about um, over the rest of this webinar. Um, so with that in mind, 
I want to just uh, tell you that we have uh, taken a, a really good look at our, our membership model, um, and um, we're going to welcome you to our kind of a, a new vision uh, for membership. We'll talk to you a little bit about why um, we felt we needed to make some of these changes. Um, hopefully we're trying to make the membership uh, in APHA more vibrant, more engaged. Um, a lot of the, what you're going to hear about today is structural. Um, just to also point out the fact that we are really actively looking at um, how to enhance our engagement with members. It's very clear to us that an engaged membership um, is a, a very important and vital part of any type of an association. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, to Sarah, uh, who is uh, runs our, our membership operation, um, and she will turn it over to Tom Quaid. Let me thank you all for joining us today. My name is Sarah Miller, Director of Membership, and as uh, you said, this is the first of three membership webinars. Um, so I will turn it over to our next guest speaker, Tom Quaid, who will be followed by Joyce um, Golfin. Tom? Thank you, Sarah. Uh, this is Tom Quaid. I, uh, um, just very briefly, my, my uh, experience with this um, res was a result of chairing the Executive Board Strategic Planning Committee last year, um, and we, dis we recognized right off the bat, uh, really, that uh, because membership was such a strong driver to all the elements of APHA's strategic plan, the, uh, the, we made the decision to pair the core work of the strategic planning committee with that of the membership work group. And uh, it was really the, that process over the, over the past year and, and then some uh, resulted in uh, the starting point for the path towards a more robust and more engaged membership for APHA. Um, and I'll go ahead and, and say it now. Uh, hopefully, uh, Dr. Benjamin hasn't left the room yet. I, 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 it should never go without saying how critical the uh, incredible amount of heavy lifting into expertise of the APHA staff, um, uh, how critical that was in 2011 and will continue to be moving forward in 2012 as we continue to evolve the models and attract uh, and engage members. So uh, I just want to make sure that we don't miss an opportunity to do that. Um, APHA's executive board uh, did identify uh, some three key reasons or, or, or elements for evaluating the organization's membership model. Um, and I need to remember to take some nice slides here. There we go. Um, number one is the status quo isn't working. I mean, it's just uh, to, to do things the same way over and over and over and expect a different result is the definition of something, and we all know what that is. Um, it, it didn't take too long once you take a look at the uh, the, the declining membership uh, and the growing market to realize that we've got um, – uh, um, a trend that is, does not make sense. Um, we have uh, a workforce that's expanding. Um, we have more and more folks that are um, becoming more and more familiar with public health. Uh, we have more folks that are involved in the practice of public health. We have more folks that are being educated in public health, and our membership is not not showing that it's we're not going in the same direction um you can see really from uh, 2008 uh, middle of 2008 on uh that 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 decline in membership it's been somewhat steady since then uh, but uh again with a growing uh, growing market a growing potential market of of uh, potential new uh, and active uh, members uh, we're not seeing them um perhaps without that it'd be even worse than it is uh you can see those those for those Folks who are not familiar with uh, with this this trend, those peaks are uh, coincide with uh, the, the summer months as folks are typically renewing as they get ready for the uh, the annual meeting. The um, let's see, I want to make sure I'm not uh, missing anything here. The second the second uh, losing my arrow. The second point there was that APHA must change uh, uh, again. While we can, we don't want to become that dinosaur. Um, the, the 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 time changes. Uh, we need to change to adapt it, uh, adapt to it. Rather, our members um, are not only growing, but the, our members are evolving. Uh, how we how we uh, our members interact with their professional association changes over time. Um, being engaged means different things over time, and so we need to make sure that we're matching that that growth that we evolve as the public health workforce evolves. Okay, so what can be changed? Um, there are a couple things that can be changed in, in the big picture of things. Uh, we can change the membership models, and we can ex and we can change how we uh, in engage that uh, those those uh, members. Um, 
the uh, with regard to the membership model, the, the major things we looked at, and this was actually um, again going back to the the uh, um, metaphor that uh, Dr. Benjamin pointed out about looking, NASA looking for the pen and finding the pencil. Uh, we did do um, a bit of looking around to see what else was out there, what different models were available, what what different uh, agencies and associations used um, in terms of membership models, and and during 2011. Uh, winnowed that uh, larger list down to a couple of, of models that made sense, and then kept winnowing it down and saying, "Okay, then you know, how far away are we from one of these things?" and and ended up with uh, what's essentially a, um, a revised current model. So, in, in looking at the membership model and what could be changed, we looked at dues. Uh, we looked at the number of members, uh, the number of member types, the different ways you can be a member, um, the definition of those member types, and the benefits that matched to uh, those member types. Um, we found a, a significant amount of um, confusion, of misalignment between benefits and types uh, of folks that were sort of in the wrong category, uh, either knowingly or, un or, un or unwittingly. Um, it was a very confusing sort of uh, arrangement. Um, probably evolved over over years of trying to to meet everybody's uh, um, wishes, and then we ended up with uh, quite a cumbersome beast. Um, the other thing that could be changed is the engagement strategy, and that's how we communicate with our members um, and making sure that we're uh, in, including members uh, um, in you know, actively in, in terms of what APHA is doing, uh, whether it's uh, the policy development or, or the advocacy or research and pre presenting at, at the uh, annual meeting and, and mentoring, any number of different things that we could that we could do, um, and also uh, in, uh, uh, taking a look at the size and scope of, of a volunteer uh, cadre. Um, so again, it's it's uh, you know. The different components of APHA membership and the engagement strategy is, you know, how we involve the people in the work of APHA. Uh, they're not going to stay if they're not if they're not engaged. And then finally, uh, and not not uh, not least important, um, there are those that would say it's perhaps most important because if if we don't take care of this, we don't we're not going to be around tomorrow to take care of the rest. And that's that APHA must protect our financial health. We do have an obligation to make sure that we are going to be around to do what we need to do. Um, as we move forward, uh, Dr. Benjamin did point out that um, uh, APHA's uh, the, the the membership is is uh, uh, one one of four different uh, major components of the budget. Um, this this slide here shows the uh, the, the relative impact of uh, of membership on on the revenue um, from 2006 to 2011, and you can see, relatively speaking, uh, the 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 revenue generated from membership um, is. Well, from 2006 to 2011 on this graph, it looks like it's about the about fairly steady. Um, I think the, the the key take home on that one is that it really should be growing given the the uh, potential members. Um, the good news is that APHA total revenue is increasing, so that's that's a plus. Um, but I think what it might be were we able to uh, to have a, a, a similar trend with regard to the the revenue generated from members. Um, so we need to uh, we need to get more. The bottom line, we need to get more members to have a, a stronger revenue base. Um, and, and beyond that, uh, a robust, engaged membership really adds adds to the value of the association beyond beyond just the dollars and cents. Okay, as I as I mentioned earlier, the um, membership is really a core, central core uh, piece of all of the strategic map, the 2010-2013 strategic map uh, for APHA. Uh, without, you need to you need to have a robust membership with, if you're going to improve the impact of policy and advocacy. Um, you need to understand that membership and to match the, uh, the benefits to the member type uh, if we're going to really say that we're providing services to members and and the profession and uh, the profession to build capacity to do what we do um, how we communicate we already mentioned that uh, and obviously to to sustain to have a sustainable uh, business model you need you need to take a good strong look at membership and have a robust membership to be able to move any of those things forward So um, the 2011 membership uh, uh, model, uh, with the shared appreciation of, of those three key points, uh, that the status quo isn't working, that APHA needs to, to evolve, um, and that we need to pr uh, protect our financial health, we really started taking a look at the existing uh, membership model uh, as, as we had it uh, in, in 2011. 
you, you can see we had uh, eight different sort of categories there, consumers, contributing members, regular members, retired members, uh, special health workers, student members, student premiums, and transitional. And, and uh, without having the um, those bullets under there uh, or more descriptive, I, I don't know that anybody would really understand what we were talking about um, just looking at a list of those titles there. Uh, what we found in taking a look at the uh, 2011 membership model is that uh, with consumers, you had 80% of them, 80% of them actually belonged in a different category. That was my earlier point that as complicated as the membership models were, uh, folks were, were landing in the wrong spots. Um, that was a uh, detriment to them. Uh, it was certainly a detriment to the association in terms of uh, the, the, uh, the, the Revenue that was not generated because they were in the consumer uh, spot instead of a regular spot or, or, or others, perhaps. Um, the benefits were the same as others, so there really wasn't anything that was distinguishing for the consumer uh, um, uh, model uh, membership type, rather. The um, uh, you take take a look at that slide and see the the uh, mismatches of what we of what we had. Um, so we took a look at it, uh, a, a bunch of those different uh, elements of each of those uh, categories, membership categories. We took that to um, a governing council in the annual meeting in, in 2011, uh, much as we did the, uh, the year before when we took the uh, strategic map in. And that's really where, that's our opportunity uh, from executive board to uh, have that active, engaged dialogue with uh, with governing council as a whole um, to really make sure that we're that we're hearing what's what's being said. Uh, you, you, the uh, the roundtable in twenty in twenty eleven was uh, uh, very well attended. Uh, there were a lot of active participation, and we heard a number of very valuable things um, that really validated some of the conversation that was happening. But essentially, the change was needed. Um, that uh, um, the, there was broad support for emerging preferred model. Uh, and that was one of those two models that we had uh, that we had um, originally discussed uh, in, in executive board, and, and uh, brought that one there. Uh, the idea was also very clear that uh, it needed to be less confusing. Um, the APHA is confusing enough. It's big enough. It's broad enough. It has enough moving parts. So we really didn't need to add to that by having so many different levels of membership. Um, and that we needed to be, we needed to have APHA be more accessible. Okay, so from the, from that, uh, we were able to move forward um, for, there were actually, we had identified five um, short-term action items and, and we're, we're, took four of those to the uh, Governing Council floor uh, at the annual meeting in 2011. Um, one, and I'm just going to read through these, one was to adopt the early career professional terminology and benefits. That was... Um, so it's sort of a combination of, of, of uh, a previous membership type. Um, the idea there that uh, it really described why folks were in that. I mean, they were they were uh, um, entering public health. Uh, it needed to be something that was uh, making APHA more accessible to that group um, that couldn't yet really uh, commit to that that full um, regular membership. Uh, level. Uh, we needed to expand eligibility for the student member category, so uh, looking to go to the um, include the six credit hour folks and as well as the full-time students before it was just the full-time students. Uh, public health is, is certainly one of those things where um, a lot of folks are, are turning to public health and realizing that it's uh, um, a big piece of what they might do, and so you have the, the, some of the non-traditional students that are working full time that that uh, uh, aren't full time, uh, and, and and we still need to be able to uh, invite them into APHA. So we have the, we expanded that to include the uh, part timers. Um, we replaced the current consumer member category with friends of public health, and we revised the benefits uh, to, to match those, and we re, uh, removed the contributing member category uh, altogether um, and integrated those members into a regular member category. Uh, we did that. And there was a little bit of confusion about that one um, because that was uh, what some folks saw as an opportunity to donate, um, but because it was actually a member category, there was some question about the, uh, the you know, being able to, to write it off as a tax deduction and, and really kind of split the focus as to what it is we were trying to accomplish with that. And uh, to, to that end, um, adding the uh, Friends of Public Health uh, was a category for donations, um, strictly donations. 
So with those changes, we ended up from that previous uh, grid to this. We no longer have the consumer contributing as they were, no longer have the student premium. We we added the early career professional, um, which is limited to three years instead of uh, uh, a one-year transitional uh, sort of thing, and uh, open it up to recent graduates over the last 24 months. Um, then the, probably the, the one of the biggest changes was this creation of this Generation Public Health, which is that non-member donation program. Uh, as I said, because it's not, you're not actually uh, getting a member, a regular membership through that. It is tax deductible. Um, you do have some benefits for donations that uh, that go beyond the $35 minimum, and uh, one of those is not a, a, a discount to APHA meetings. It needs to be something that distinguishes that that. Uh, um, opportunity to donate from actually becoming a regular member. Um, so you can see the, the the items there. Take a look through those and we get to the end. Certainly welcome any questions because this is probably the slide that uh, um, best represents the changes that, uh, that we have uh, already made going forward. Um, so let's see. Sorry, I'm having problems getting to the advanced thing here. All right. So Things are better. There have been there have been some significant changes. Um, it it is uh, hopefully less confusing. Um, we think that uh, that folks are going to be able to better connect with the type of membership they have. Uh, probably even know what membership they have, where that might not have been the case in the past. And we ha actually already have uh, been receiving some some positive feedback about those changes. One thing that folks will see as they as they uh, click to uh, to join now, um, this is the the the, uh, the page as you see that have the different membership categories on it. It is it is much much more. It's 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 still a little busy, but it's much cleaner, much clearer. Um, there are fewer membership types. Uh, the, the the format is a whole lot easier to deal with. Um, there are some new dues amounts. Um, then that was uh, as a result of some uh, of decisions that were passed previously in, in terms of the, the price index. Um, and uh, we do have some the revised descriptions with, the, with each of those. Again, trying to make this a little clearer, a little cleaner, and a little bit easier to communicate to folks. All right, so you think that uh, with all of that we were done, but we're not. <laughs> there are uh, more changes to make. Um, the changes so far that, that have been made um, affected just about 1,500 of the existing uh, members. Um, so there, there, uh, there's what another 24,000 members waiting for their change. Uh, the the idea here was to make things more accessible, um, and I think we've we, we've got, taken some big strides down that path. Uh, make things clearer and more understandable. I think we've taken some big strides down that path, uh, and there's there's some more work to be done. Um, we will be looking at. Uh, somewhat evolving the, the 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 narrative, if you will, from from uh, changing the membership models, which we're still doing, um, to engaging the members, and that's what what uh, uh, the next speaker, Joyce Goffin, is going to be speaking about, is really sort of the 2012. Uh, what's next? And so with with that, um, I would uh, encourage you to remember any questions you have, and at the end of this, uh, please do pose them. But at this point, I'll pass it on to Joyce. So thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, again, I'm Joyce Goffin. I'm a member of the Executive Board of APHA, and I was asked to serve as the chair of the Membership Committee. And I think, it's, as Tom mentioned, it's always a wonderful opportunity for us to talk about the great work of the APHA staff. Uh, from the end of the annual meeting until the 1st of January, they've accomplished a tremendous amount of work. They continually keep the board informed of the changes that are going on. And uh, while we have a lot of transparency going on between the board and the staff, we think it's important to have the transparency between the board and our members. And so we're so happy to have over 80 people join us on the call today. I uh, note that several members of our executive board and members of the membership committee are on the call. I believe our president is on the call, uh, Dr. Mel Shipp. So uh, you're in good company, and we uh, want to give you some other important information about what we're going to be doing in the, the near future. 
Our executive board membership work group consists of four of the general members of the executive board, myself, Darrell Fox, Paul Meisner, and uh, Miley Tuaali, and uh, the past president, Linda Ray Murray. Uh, we represent the executive board, and then Catherine Cooksley represents our committee on affiliates. Gail Bellamy represents the intersectional council. Kay Bender represents the education board. Brittany Marshall represents the student assembly. And Lynn Bethel represents the action board. And uh, Sarah Miller, Miller is our staff support. And so this is a good group of people. They represent almost all of the components that you can think of in APHA. Uh, they're approachable, and the idea is that this is a large systems change, and there are many parts that are affected. So we're trying to keep it moving together so that when a change comes on that can affect one thing, it might be affecting something else. And the same thing is going on internally within the APHA staff. With a large-scale systems change, they have an internal committee that's headed by Sarah, but it includes people from IT and finance and development and all of the other parts so that they can be sure to work together in unison to move us forward. While we, uh, ex we are glad that people are participating in general calls like this webinar, if you do have specific questions or, or concerns, uh, we do encourage you to go to your, your component group, the, the group that most closely represents you, and share your concerns that way. Uh, we're talking about possibility of adding something like a discussion group to the APHA website so that people could have some general information and make general comments. The short-term changes address some of our known and major issues. And of course, uh, you've had a chance to see what some of those were, uh, the, the declining uh, revenue from our membership stream and declining membership in light of the fact that there are more people than ever working in public health. As we go through this, there is an executive board meeting scheduled in May, and uh, membership will be a big part of our meeting, as well as the June governing council meeting. And I assume many of you may be a part of that governing council. Uh, as the internal staff works on things to uh, bring this about, to get additional information, to make recommendations to the board, uh, the membership group is also going to be working with membership uh, chairs from the various component areas too, especially our sections. So it, we're, it's a big effort. It takes a lot of people to do this kind of work. And one of our challenges is constantly communicating and making sure those channels stay open. Uh, the original report that the executive board received last year was something of about 75 pages, and it contained huge amounts of data about the status of the people who were surveyed, including members and non-members of APHA. And here were just a few highlights that we thought might be interesting for the group. As you can see in the age category of 22 to 30, 50% of that group are students, which probably isn't surprising to anyone. But the group of 51 to 65, 45% uh, are members of the, primarily members of sections and SPIGs. And uh, the, really the future of APHA lies with our students. And so the change in membership to allow our students to stay engaged and involved at a lower cost as they, as they graduate from school is a real opportunity, and it's an opportunity for the sections and SPIGs to look at that, that big number of students and uh, find value for them so that they'll stay as continuing members. Uh, the information on the mix of university and academic members versus those who work uh, at state, local, or tribal health departments, about 40% academic and a little less than 15% state and tribal members. And one, this pretty much replicates what we see across the general membership of APHA, uh, as I understand it. Now, this is a self-identified category, so uh, people may work in different places or they may not give us that information. And I think what's interesting here is that uh, while APHA has a, a very large academic group, as, as a former uh, past president of a Public, a state public health association, uh, I would say that the numbers are certainly reversed in the case of most of our, our affiliate organizations. Um, I don't know if that's true for all of the affiliates, but the ones that I belong to, uh, typically we have a lot more people who are in the practice group. 
Uh, the next one on the primary focus of the work that people do, again, uh, academic, most of them are, uh, uh, the current members are mostly from academic programs. Uh, the lapsed members, these are people who have been members but for some reason have, are not current members, uh, are from research and development and again, the uh, non-members are often the people from the public health practice community. Uh, th this slide talks about the importance that people place on each of the APHA membership benefits and the one that's stands out is the second item, scientific information and public health. Uh, people who identify themselves as being primary members of sections and SPIGs have identified that as their number one issue and of importance as well as students. Then we start to see a little bit of uh, diversion here and so the advocacy issues are also very important to members of sections and SPIGs and they also talk about the need to have uh, a place where they can unify all facets of public health in a single organization. And I think that as you uh, develop your career in public health and you reach out and see just how large the system is, you understand the importance of, of trying to unify these various facets. Uh, for students, their second issue, of course, is professional contacts and networking for career growth, and uh, that's important information for those of us who are trying to encourage these uh, student members to stay on and eventually join one of our sections or SPIGs. There were, there were a lot of uh, slides that we went through. Again, these are just some samples of the kind of data that were collected. Uh, this one is a slide that indicates the importance of each item to these various groups when they were first considering APHA membership. So there's an important uh, element to this because it helps us understand what we need to know about recruiting new members. Uh, this one has a lot of difference in it. Uh, obviously for the people who are identifying themselves as being part of sections, the, uh, to obtain up-to-date information about important issues, just as we saw in that last slide, it was their number one issue for joining. Uh, then their second issue is to attend the annual meetings and other events. Uh, for the student group, they're the same number one, in fact, across all categories, the number one issue was this up-to-date information, which really is the same thing as saying we want to be the go-to organization for public health. So it really says that people want to, to look at APHA as the go-to organization for this kind of information. Uh, but then there's a lot of difference here in, in how these different groups rank their priorities. Again, students join APHA not only for that information but to establish professional networks. And uh, the current members uh, are in that same category. Lapsed and non-members, I think it's almost interesting to see that uh, while non-members of APHA think about APHA as that go-to organization, uh, they really aren't very involved and engaged in, they don't think about attending the annual meetings and that could largely be because they're from the practice field and as we all know, budgets are extremely tight right now. Some of the additional areas that we need to address and this gets into a lot of detail are the financial implications that, that uh, can come about with this kind of a change. And one of the things that we're talking about with the changing dues rates is that even though the dues could gradually increase, uh, if we're losing members, that membership revenue could still go down. So we're trying to make sure that we're keeping a focus not only on, on the financial side, on the, the dues rates and what revenue is coming in, but what is happening with the members. Are we retaining more members? Uh, certainly there's an implication for section budgets because if people join APHA, the section budgets are determined by the number of members in a given section. And as you saw earlier, one of the questions that's come up is should we be offering people a second, an automatic second membership to a different section as part of their membership dues? So there's a lot of study that needs to be done to that. And while the uh, the internal team is modeling uh, possibilities and the financial implications. They also need to have a plan in place to mitigate any uh, near-term decrease in revenue that could happen while these transitions are taking place. Uh, certainly, there's a need to keep the website up to date, and uh, they've, they've already done an incredible job of getting things up and running and ready to go for the 1st of January. Uh, the internal committee has to manage 
the plans, the uh, implementation and supporting this change system. And they have a detailed plan in place that identifies what they're doing uh, not only month to month but almost week to week. As they go through this process, they keep in touch with the membership committee and in turn we keep up to date with uh, the other members of the board. There are certain issues about the registration and dues process that need to be addressed online. I think they've really cleaned up that form in a very nice way. It certainly is cleaner than it was before. And then we have questions of how we validate uh, member eligibility types. Uh, and I think that they've also addressed those questions in this revised model. Um, we always have the accessibility issues. Why do people not join APHA? And one is obviously uh, the cost of membership. And I was interested to find out that some of the ideas that, that were brought up about paying over time or having an automatic payment withdrawal uh, was, is actually in place at this point in time, but very few people use that. And so if a membership, member registration fee is, uh, or membership fee is $200 a year, you're talking about something like $14 a month and the student membership might be $5 a month. So perhaps, you know, we have other opportunities on how we can market the membership cost. Uh, the logistics is a barrier. A lot of people have, have difficulty participating actively in APHA. If they don't come to the annual meeting, uh, they miss a lot of what it is that APHA is doing. So last year, and again this year, we're going to have a mid-year meeting, uh, June 26th to 28th in Charlotte, North Carolina. And this is another opportunity for people who may not get to that annual meeting to come and attend one of these regional events. And, of course, the affiliates present a very great opportunity for us where we can touch new members and try to do something to engage them uh, on a more personal basis and make them want to become a member of APHA. And while they may not be able to afford the full membership cost, uh, we would imagine that a good number of these people may look at something like the Friends of Public Health category and want to participate because they want to be a part of that big go-to organization for public health. So we're going to be working with the affiliates to see how we can really pump that up. Uh, under the ownership issues, now we're starting to talk a lot about the engagement process of uh, our APHA members, and we think that it's important that members know about the clear goals and major milestones we have for the organization. Uh, they need to know what things we're really working on, and they need to be updated not only on this work, but we need to show our appreciation for them when they help us accomplish the goals. And an example of this would be the number of people who respond to uh, the emails that ask them to contact their uh, congressmen and women and uh, legislators and others to talk about priorities for APHA and how we can advocate uh, for better policy. So we want to be sure that we have a way to let them know just how important that is to the overall goals. And we want people to feel like they're a part of any victory that we create as the go-to organization. And again, we want to broaden the perspective of who belongs to APHA. It's not a group of strictly academics, and it's not just people who work in state, local, and federal, regional public health programs. These are people who work in community-based organizations. We want to be as inclusive as possible. Uh, we really believe that everybody has a vested interest in public health, and we really want to expand that particular group. Um, our next steps are to fully develop that revised current model, and again, with the staff working on all of these different p moving parts, uh, they, they have to uh, get in touch with our, our membership group. They run, run the major changes by the membership group, and we give them feedback on that process. Uh, they have an external consultant who helps them because, again, as we saw on this slide, sometimes people from other organizations may have uh, tools and models that we can use in our own group. And the very important part of communicating our changes to the members. And that is so important that we have developed three webinars that are open to all members of APHA. Uh, right now we're just telling you a little bit about where we've been and what we've been doing. The next um, membership meeting or webinar is on March 13th. We'll talk more specifically about membership types and benefits. And on April 13th, 
we'll be talking about the implication of financial changes as we do this membership revision. And uh, we would encourage you to call back in at any of those times. If it's the 13th of the month, it must be time for an APHA webinar. Uh, obviously, we've been uh, working with the ISC in sections, and we're participating in some of their meetings. As board members of APHA, we have liaison responsibilities, and, and we hope that the board members are doing their outreach to the different component groups. Uh, there have been great stories in the Nation's Health and Inside Public Health art articles that come out that talk about this change. It seems like I'm seeing something about membership at least every week, uh, just in the general mail that I, I get from APHA. Uh, we're also talking about ways we can develop stories and updates where we can maybe highlight the value and the benefits of APHA membership by having people who are members share their stories of what they get out, what is the value, what is the benefit of being a member of APHA. Uh, additional website, uh, additional member surveys are going on, and they're going to focus in on questions like this uh, addition of a second section with membership. And I think the real meat of this to those of us who work in leadership positions is uh, trying to really focus on those member benefits and the engagement strategies. And while we haven't gotten deep into that process at this point in time because we're working on the technical side of things, these are really absolutely critical because we are a member organization. We exist for our members. And uh, members of the board, members of our membership committee, certainly the people from the sections and the SPIGs and the uh, affiliates are very excited and very engaged, and many of them already have wonderful models and ideas for how we can better engage our members. So our ask to you is that we want to hear from you. Uh, we encourage you to participate in the, the webinar series. Uh, we encourage you, if you're contacted, to participate in a survey, survey to uh, do that. And uh, again, we want you to reach out to your organizational components uh, share your thoughts about the current issues for membership models and suggestions for change, and that includes strategies for further engaging our members. Uh, you've got the dates and the time set for our webinar series. You know, maybe you want to print out this page, get this page, and get all these dates in your calendars so that you'll know when they're coming up. And um, with that, trying to keep us on time, uh, we would like to now open this up, operator, for questions and answers. I note that there are some things that have been going on on the sideline. Thank you. At this time, we will open the floor for questions. If you would like to ask a question, please press the star key followed by the one key on your touchstone phone now. Questions will be taken in the order in which they are received. If at any time you would like to remove yourself from the questioning queue, press star 2. Again, to ask a question, press star 1. Our first question comes from Kimberly Devers. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the great presentation. My question is regarding student membership. If um, you must have graduated, or I'm sorry, the early career professional, if you must have graduated from a school um, of public health, or will you also accept public policy uh, recent graduates that studied health policy? Thank you. Okay, I'm going to leave that to um, Sarah. That's Hi, thanks for the question. Um, the early career professional category is open to any recent graduate, regardless of discipline. So um, you are welcome to join that category. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Walter Sal. Hi. Uh, I just, it's just more of a comment, perhaps. But uh, I think, you know, one of the problems for APHA is the area of health informatics and the fact that there's a whole section like HIMSS and other uh, conferences that have evolved in the time of APHA that have, you know, regular attendance of 20 to 50,000 people who come to their meetings uh, for health informatics, and meanwhile, we were sort of waiting around to finally get together a, a SPIG and then maybe a section for public health informatics, and I think we sort of missed the boat on trying to capture that whole segment, and what I'm, I guess, more important for me is to be able to respond quickly to changes in uh, the types of 
uh, professions that are going out there in, in society so that we could um, get those people into APHA rather than giving them an opportunity to start their own societies. That's my Thank comment. you, Walter. That That is a challenge to business, and uh, the executive board is, is looking at this as an opportunity to uh, – not only retain our members, but recruit new members. One of the challenges that I know we've had in the past is that uh, many members do not have APHA as their primary membership. There are some of our specialty groups, uh, the podiatrists, the optometrists, and so on, who have other professional associations that they join, so APHA becomes a secondary membership. And the same may be true for some of these people with health information technology, uh, but we do have an active section. And as we look at this, if, if we have sections who can give us feedback of what's going on in their particular area or in their particular profession, uh, maybe they can help us stay ahead of the curve on these kinds of changes. And then let me just open that up for anyone else who would like to respond. No one else? Okay. Do we have another question? Okay. Our next question comes from Tammy Polysuk. Hi. Um, I've been sort of all over the chat <laughs> for those of you who have been looking at that. But my concern is with um, this sort of um, – it's kind of a split goal that – that APHA seems to have. On the one hand, you want to maintain your financial integrity, and I totally understand that. But on the other hand, you want to engage more members. And I see that one of the ways that you engage more members is to provide more low-cost opportunities to join APHA. I, mean, I, I think the cost of attending the annual meeting is prohibitive to many, many people. And, I mean... I, one of the comments that I made on the chat is that for those of us who have been quite active in in the association and have worked ourselves our way up to leadership roles, either within our section or for me, I'm now on the governing council, uh, there's absolutely no category of discount, and yet I have no financial reimbursement from my employer. So it's an outlay of, you know, close to $2,000 for coming um, to the meeting. Last year I was able to um, cajole some uh, a, a friend to help me out with registration. I stayed in someone else's hotel room. You know, I found a cheap flight. Um, I didn't eat for most of the week <laughs> except the free breakfast at the hotel. I mean, there's a, there's a limit to how, <laughs> how often you can, you know, sort of finagle around the, you know, the high cost, um, and and it's problematic. I mean, it really stands as a barrier uh, both to attending the, the meeting and in discouraging people who want to become more actively involved and engaged and participate in leadership because, you know, you're, you're supposed to commit to going to the annual meeting even stay for an extra day or two, um, and that it all boils down to a cost issue. I mean, I think there should be some incentive. Uh, Tammy, I'm very cognizant of, of that barrier, and as someone who's been an active member of APHA and a, a leader for a number of years, uh, I can't remember a, a time where I attended the annual meeting where I didn't have a, a roommate, someone to help share that burden, and for a good part of my career, I was fortunate to have an employer who could help cover the, the cost. And we know that that's really difficult for people. And for those who, who have commitments, such as governing council members, uh, with the expectation you will attend the meeting, uh, it, is, it is very difficult. And we would, you know, really appreciate hearing from you about any ideas you have to help overcome these barriers. What are, what are some of the best ways we can do this? When you talk about discounts, um, it, it is difficult because we do not have, a, at this time, a reduced rate for uh, registration fees at the annual meeting and so on for, for people who are there on APHA business. Uh, well, I mean, you're looking at different categories of 
of membership. So, um, I mean, there's certainly, I don't know if you, you would have to do it on the honor system or you could get, you know, the person's employer to write a letter. But, you know, if someone um, is in a leadership position and they um, and they don't have any other documentation, waiving the registration fee would go really a long way. I mean, I was willing to find a cheap flight and do all of the other things. But having to, you know, pay that $600 of the um, membership renewal and the registration fee, if I hadn't had someone to help me do that, I wouldn't have been able to come last year. And, you know, I really wanted to come because it was my first year on the Governing Council. Mm -hmm. I, I think these are really important questions about how we engage members, especially around the annual meeting. And I, I note in the discussion board that it was mentioned that some people might be able to attend the mid-year meetings uh, where potentially they're, they're shorter meetings. People may have less travel and so on as, as a way to um, participate more actively but at a lower cost. I, I personally don't see that as as much of a solution because, you know, there's only one mid-year meeting and it can be in only one place in the country, so there's still travel. I saw that it was still quite expensive to attend. Um, so for me, that it's not much of an alternative. Again, that contingents an expansion of what we've been doing, but we're looking for other options. Uh, I'm making some notes here, and uh, Tammy, we uh, do you belong to a section? Yes, I'm in... Uh, CHPPD, the Community Health Planning and Policy Development. And uh, I know uh, Walter Sue is also in that, that section. And, and uh, I think it would be really important, again, for you to give feedback, especially through your section, to some of these barriers. And uh, I'm sure you're not the only person with, with that kind of an issue. Uh, you're absolutely right. Our goal is to serve well the members that we have and at the same time to try to involve more people with low-cost options. So we'll be looking for suggestions from members on how we can address that. Uh, Tom, I don't know if you or, or anyone else would like to, to address that. Yeah, I, I, I'll just chime in that um, I, <laughs> I understand. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to say I feel your pain, <laughs> but, 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 but I do. I I'm, I'm a, um, a work for, a, 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 relatively speaking, a small local health district um, and have always, you know, have always had to, to pay my way to APHA. I don't think I've missed one yet. Um, it is a challenge, and leadership is it, it. Leadership is one of those tough things. We are working. I mean, in addition to trying to come up with some solutions to the problems that, that you've identified, um, just how to capture more folks um, in, into into that leadership pathway um, to make to make it more accessible. Um, the it is one of those member benefits. I, I, people sort of talk about member benefits um, pretty loosely. I actually joined APHA for the opportunity of um, move, you know, of developing those leadership skills, of taking on those leadership responsibilities. And yeah, it does come at a cost. Um, and that cost is is partially, you know, balanced out against the the, the benefit to us. I mean, we do those things um, partly out of a sense of altruism, but partly out of a sense of, of self development as well, and and advancing public health as a as a whole. And it does it doesn't, you know, it's it's not a cheap. Uh, process that that mid year meeting is um, as Joyce described it is is one alternative it's not the end all be all solution to the issue it's something that we didn't have uh, two years ago that we do have uh, that we did do last year to with some success and and again this year in Charlotte um, and so I would encourage folks to to take a look at that and see what uh, what uh, benefits it does bring again it's not the hundred percent solution to this to this this uh, question um, the other is to to help come up with some solutions um, because that is uh, you know ultimately the, the the starting point for for leadership is is not only identifying the uh, the issues but but some of the some of the solutions um, we do have an awful lot of opportunities to in, to become engaged and active in, in APHA that don't uh, necessarily require somebody to be at uh, at the annual meeting. Although certainly it's it's enhanced by that, and we wouldn't hope that everybody that could make it can make it, um, but are always looking for for other ways to deal with it. Thank you so much. Thanks for your response, Tom. Uh, do we have any other questions on the line, operator? Our next question comes from Carol Wolchering. Hi, hi, Joyce. Um, I was wondering if in this plan 
there are also the linked options of being a member and being a co-member of your state affiliate. Uh, we've yes. been to California for a number of times. And so you can answer that, but I have a statement to make. I think um, the issue of value added in a uh, non-face-to-face but synchronous and asynchronous way is really important for organizations to survive in the future. And I think it's time to really bite that bullet in APHA. And, you know, the only real solution that seems to be commented on is another physical face-to-face -face meeting. In leadership development, as Joyce knows, you have to have face-to-face -face meetings to build relationships and to get the cohort, let's say a cohort of people going for a year. But after that, we've become more and more reliant on webinars and interactive webinars, not just talking head webinars, um, that are archived, that have real value because people can do them asynchronously or synchronously. And so my question is, what thought, so, so I heard a yes about the joint membership, that's good. What thought are you giving to really busting open the whole paradigm of how you keep this incredible network of more diverse, over time, professionals who really care about public health policy and the work that APHA does, certainly on that level, that have their own network, but like the network within APHA. It's not the only one we all have. Want to support students where the face-to-face, -face, especially the face-to-face -face ability to present their work is such a wonderful leadership development opportunity, but meet the needs of the changing environment and all the new information and the critical things and really begin to sponsor. I, li I love the idea of the same day of the month um, webinar. Um, and, and even maybe more than one a month, the sections can be sponsoring them and all of that. But I think if it was more vital and there was more activity and energy, people would say you can't not be a member of APHA and stay in the, new, in the know about what's going on. Thank you, Carol. That's exactly what we want to hear people say is we can't not be members of APHA. And in terms of value added, uh, I don't know if Dr. Bender is on the call or not. She is the chair of our education board. I was on the education board right until the time I, I was elected to the executive board. And at that time, we were very carefully looking at our options for delivering uh, webinars as a way for outreach because the, the cost could be uh, either run a range of nothing to something very small, perhaps, if people were interested in getting continuing education credits for that. Uh, they're looking at uh, surveys that they've identified uh, potential topics and potential presenters. And so this is something I know that APHA is very, very interested in doing. And many sections, uh, even my own section, Health Administration, is uh, looking at offering webinars uh, particularly designed for health administration members, but perhaps uh, there is a, an opportunity to have those recorded and made, make them available to other members. Um, absolutely, we need to take advantage of technology. Uh, our board is going to actually use uh, technology for our next board meeting. We're, we're working on uh, getting more and more literate in this area. And I think the other thing is how we leverage our partnerships with other uh, organizations that might have resources that they could they can help share with APHA. Uh, these uh, could be groups, for instance, the California Endowment, uh, their Dialogue for Health program, uh, using that as a model that, that perhaps we can uh, invite people from uh, APHA to join in on mm -hmm. those things by making the information more available. Uh, Tom, did you want to quickly answer the question about the joint memberships? Yeah, actually, and, and, and they, both, they both sort of um, uh, coincide, the idea of, of using the webinars and, and the conversation about joint memberships. The one, one thing that, that I've, I've recognized uh, that APHA has been incredibly uh, uh, very, well, to, 
incredibly active with is providing the webinars for technical assistance on shared learning with the uh, with the state affiliates local affiliates I keep calling them state affiliates but there's a couple with uh, with multiples um, we do have uh, where it's either we're in the third or fourth year I'm not sure which now because time is flying so quickly of, of a pilot project with joint membership with um, uh, Massachusetts Ohio Cal Northern California and I want to say Kansas but it might not be Kansas um, I think it is Kansas with uh, joint memberships between the affiliate and and uh, APHA as a whole, and there's been an awful lot of activity there in terms of of uh, uh, engaging those affiliates with APHA. I can I just scanned down the participants for today's call and, and saw at least three or four, if not more, um, folks from the Ohio affiliate that are on this on this webinar right now. Um, I think partly because of the the increased uh, involvement with uh, a relationship between APHA and the state affiliate. I think that's a wonderful starting place. Um, there are some certainly some some challenges to figure out to sort through in terms of of dues and and making that work uh, in, in terms of the math. Uh, but I think there's an awful lot of promise there. And yes, that's a, that is a very good example of some of the uh, the uh, technological advances and 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 having APHA and the affiliates being able to access one another. And if and if it can work for an affiliate, it can certainly work for individual members as well. And I think we'll we'll be able to see some more progress in that regard. And I apologize, but I do need to run. I've got a 4.30 appointment that's more than half an hour away, so i got to run. But uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Carol. I hope we answered a good part of your question. Uh, an excellent idea and uh, fits in with this idea of how we can better do member engagement. Um, do we have any additional questions in the queue? Yes, our next question comes from Roy Grant. Hi, uh, thank you for taking my question. It's actually more of a comment. I wanted to pick up on uh, what Walter had said earlier and suggest that um, and, uh, there are other uh, organizations that have um, affiliate conferences that um, generate their own um, attendance that cost considerably less than the annual meeting. One example is Academy Health, which is much smaller than APHA. It's about uh, 3,000 uh, attendees for the main conference. But there are several uh, special interest groups. The, the Child Health uh, Research Meeting is uh, a particularly um, ha has become a particularly important child health research meeting in its own right, and I believe it costs about $75 to attend. People can um, attend that and not attend the, ma the, the main meeting Abstracts that are presented can be presented at both if they're accepted for both. The uh, cost to the uh, uh, organization is borne by uh, a um, large conference grant from AHRQ, and that might be something to consider in terms of um, a way to and, – and by the way, it's held the, the um, day before the main conference. The main conference begins on Sunday. The child health research meeting is Saturday, so the people who attend both, they're contiguous. People can come in for just one. Um, it's income generating, and as I say, the cost is uh, is set aside, um, for, uh, is, is, is managed through an AHRQ grant. Um, pediatric academic societies, or actually I think it's the Academy of Pediatrics, has a separate um, conference on uh, technology. It's, uh, the acronym is COCIT. Um, but that generates people who are specifically interested in health information technology uh, as it pertains to pediatrics. It's uh, the conference is a cost center. It draws people in that for one reason or other might not attend the main conference. Uh, so I'm suggesting that um, a, uh, a more of a focus on the application of health information technology in public health could be a, uh, a draw to bring people in as members or uh, and or to create an opportunity for people to attend uh, a conference that uh, uh, might not be able to afford uh, the full conference. Uh, there might be other, uh, I think uh, child health might be one, but there might be other uh, areas where um, a very specific self-contained focus could become the object of a conference that's contiguous with but separate from the annual meeting. And I would encourage exploring AHRQ large conference grants as a way to uh, offset the cost. Roy, thank you so much for your comments, for taking the time to join the call and give us your feedback today. I've jotted these ideas down. Some of these fall within the 
the uh, realm of our membership group and our engagement strategies, and some cross over a little bit into conference and program planning, but we'll make sure that these ideas are forwarded and we'll keep these in mind. And I um, appreciate your time. Thank you. I understand there are a couple more people on, on the queue, and uh, let's see if we can go to the next question. Okay, it looks like we just have one other person one in the person. queue, and that's Laura Magena. Laura, you may go ahead. Thank you very much. This is uh, Gabriela. I'm uh, on behalf of Dr. Magana from the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico. I appreciate a lot all the comments uh, um, addressed uh, before. And just to, to remind you <laughs> that there are also members abroad and uh, who would be benefit a lot from all these uh, issues that have been brought up. Uh, I would like to ask uh, for, uh, better say, to mention, uh, for example, this, this phone call. This is a good example for us. It has been an extremely interesting and useful phone call for us, but it's a long-distance call that my institute will have to, to, to pay, and we would very much like to, uh, to participate and uh, give feedback in all of the webinars or seminars that you give. Sometimes this um, makes it difficult to us when we have to make a one-hour phone call. So perhaps talking about um, moving on and um, leaving the, all the barriers um, behind, perhaps another system could be used for the future instead of a webinar. There are other systems like WebEx mm -hmm. where, other, where you only need a computer and earphones and there it's no cost at all. Thank right. you very much. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. It's wonderful to hear that our partners uh, south of the border are engaged in our call today and uh, understand the, the limit placed on making that kind of a long-distance call. Uh, we will explore those options, especially as we talk about how we can deliver webinars uh, for a general and broader membership group. Uh, excellent ideas. Um, I know that we're, we're trying to do more of this uh, within the board and within the groups that are, are meeting throughout the year for APHA. Uh, so that, that's an excellent suggestion. We will note that and see if we can uh, do some planning around that. Thank you so much for your call. Thank you. I, I believe that is our last call in queue. Is that correct, operator? Uh, we have another question. Oh, our next question is from Michael Clements. Okay, this will be our last question. Oh, thank you for being the last question. <laughs> Uh, this is Michael Clements in uh, North Carolina, and um, I was just typing that question in because I thought I wasn't going to get in. And the question is, um, does does the does APHA basically create some revenue from the annual conference, such that there really is a desire outside of the desire to network, outside of the desire to connect with uh, our colleagues and and use that as a learning opportunity? Is there also a incent a a desire for APHA to have people come to the annual conference because it also generates funds for operating expenses? The brief answer to that is yes. I'm wondering uh, perhaps if Susan Poland would, uh, I believe Dr. Benjamin had to leave the call. Susan, would you like to talk about that a little bit? I'm sorry, can, can you repeat exactly the question? I believe it has to do with does APHA use the revenue from conference registration? Is that an important revenue stream for APHA? The conference it does several different things. It is an important revenue stream. It helps subsidize all the other of the other activities that we do, including um, the journal and, and the nation's health and all the other activities. It also does drive membership because people do tend to register and renew their membership for the annual meeting, although that's not everybody, it does, um, it does help to do that as well. So in, when you take that into consideration, it drives a considerable amount of revenue for the association, but, it, but in terms of the actual profits from the meeting, it's a, it's a smaller piece, but still significant, so that we can continue to do all the other work that we do. Thank you, Susan. Um, Information on APHA uh, finances and that are provided to the Governing Council every year, and I believe we have reports that, that are available for members to take a look at those uh, budget figures. And uh, 
I, I'm not exactly sure if that's in our, our executive board material or if that would be under governing council, but it's uh, a budget that people are, are welcome to take a look at. And uh, uh, it's an important question that helps remind us why, why the annual meetings are so important. We know that uh, membership renewals increase right before the annual meeting for many people. Um, I believe that uh, this is time where we need to, to summarize our, our meeting and uh, close. Is that right, Sarah? That is correct. Okay. Uh, again, thank you so much for your participation today. Uh, this has been uh, very useful information for our membership committee, for APHA staff, uh, for other APHA leaders who have been on our phone call today. Uh, we have several items that we'll be looking at. Again, the next few calls really focus on uh, some of our technical issues, uh, but before our governing council meeting in June, we'll really be starting into this process of membership engagement, and you've given us some excellent food for thought and some excellent recommendations. Uh, thank you again to the staff for helping and for our uh, technical staff on the webinar, and thank you so much to everyone who took the time to participate today.